Okay, welcome everybody. Tonight we are continuing in our series on deception. We are looking at session five tonight. I will quickly do a recap of the previous four sessions just so that everything links and if people watch the video separately that they know where we are. Um, you will remember in the first sessions we looked at the warnings that Jesus, Paul, John and Peter gave us out of scripture. From there, we looked at the two main ditches or dis main deceptions, uh, legalism and hypergrace, or I like what David Pawson um, names it. He names it law and license. Then we looked at the doctrines of demons, the doctrines of Christ and the apostles, and the fact that we need to test the spirits. Then we looked at overcoming deception and the different ways that scripture gives us to overcome it. Then we look at, at, at the importance of identifying fruit um, because scripture says you'll know a tree by its fruit. Then we looked at certain signs of deception. And most of these first signs we looked at was concerning hyper grace or license functioning. And then last time we started looking at the signs of legalism, the signs, signs of deception, especially relevant for legalistic functioning. Uh, and it's not that these things are exclusive to legalistic functioning, but very typical of legalistic functioning. So tonight we will continue um, in the same vein. We looked at Matthew 23 and Luke 11 and Luke 20 um, as the basis of finding those specific signs of legalistic deception. We have to remember these are portions of scripture where Jesus himself is speaking especially to the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus himself is giving us insight in the traits and the things in the lives and the functioning of these law-keeping individuals and leaders. And out of that, we will get a lot of information. So tonight we will delve into more depths out of what Jesus said in these portions of Scripture. And I will specifically start at Matthew 23, verse 13. Uh, which is the next verse from where we stopped last time. So in Matthew 23, 13, Jesus says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So the, the first point we are looking at tonight is the fact that legalism breeds hypocrisy. And in many of the scriptures we've read so far, we have looked at this whole issue of hypocrisy. But Jesus speaks here and he says, woe to you. David Pawson says in his teaching that the word woe is in fact something that denotes a curse. So when Jesus uses this word, he is really using a loaded word. It's no, it's no small matter that Jesus is talking about. Jesus exclaims his dismay at the very religious leaders of the Jewish society he lived in. They were the keepers of law, the promoters of the legalistic order of Judaism. And repeatedly, even in this chapter that we are looking at, he uses the word hypocrites, which means they are somebody that assumes a character like a stage player. The word, in fact, can also be replaced with the word deceiver. In a modern definition for deception, it, it basically means that a deceiver is someone who leads you to believe something that is not true. So these Religious leaders were trying to portray things to other people that were not true, whether they were portraying it about themselves and who they were really were, or whether they were portraying it, um, portraying it concerning the truths that they were teaching. Now, this is exactly what acting is. It is to create a persona to make others believe you are someone you are not. You are not showing your true character but an alternative fictional character. And this is what these leaders did. They spent a lot of effort to present a very specific image to their followers and the public, and it takes up much of their time and their energy. And I'm, I get worried if I look at modern ministers and I see that they invest an extreme amount of time in creating a specific public image. That worries me because that's exactly what the Pharisees did. Now, Scripture talks about, about the people that have the image or the form of godliness, but they deny, deny the power thereof. And this is what these Pharisees were doing. 
That word image and form means appearance, a semblance, or a formula to, to make themselves look like they are godly, like they have piety, as if they are holy. But they are denying, and that word denying in 2 Timothy 3, 5 is, 5 is to contradict, to reject, to refuse the power thereof. And when men spend more time and effort in cultivating the appearance of being godly than developing the substance of holy living, we are dealing with a paradigm of deception. This is not just typical, but unavoidable when it comes to legalism. Why? Because law cannot change your sin nature. It, in fact, empowers your sin nature. No one, no one can see their nature changed when they are functioning in law. Now, they must work to hide their sin because they cannot overcome it, because law does not empower you to overcome sin. And this is exactly what these legalists did. This is exactly what these Pharisees did. Next we see in verse 13, we see that legalists tend to block people from entering the kingdom of God. In Matthew 23, 13, Jesus continues to say to them, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourself, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. That word to shut up is the word kleo. It means to close. That's the word we get the word key from. So scripture says that these legalists, these religious leaders in Jesus' time, shut up and closed the kingdom of heaven so that people could not go in. These men were not willing to give people access to the kingdom of heaven the reign of God. In fact, they did the opposite. They made the kingdom of heaven inaccessible. They locked it so that no one could enter. Legalism does not represent the kingdom of heaven, but it re represents earthly kingdoms. We see this is if we look at Judaism, the Jewish religious leaders presented the kingdom of Israel, of Judaism, not the kingdom of God. And people must understand, if we look at the scripture, that legalism pulls us to what is visible. It pulls us to what is earthly, external, physical, and temporal. It keeps the focus on man and his actions. It calls man to do more and in accordance with a set of rules and instructions to try better. But the kingdom of God is very different. The kingdom of God is vastly different. It calls us to the invisible, heavenly, internal, spiritual, and eternal. In Christ, we are called to focus on God, to be spirit-led, so he may transform us into the image of Christ. So we see that these two realities are worlds apart. The reality of legalism that we especially now see in the scribes and the Pharisees is not the reality of the kingdom of God. That is why the legalist minister does not enter the kingdom of God. This is quite a shock to see that Jesus says they have not even entered. They themselves have not entered. Though he claims, though this minister may claim to represent the kingdom, Jesus shows that they are not part, not even part of God's kingdom. Even though they speak of God and many times say that they speak for God in the hearing of their followers. Now, these men taught Moses and advocated the precepts Moses received from God all those years ago. This in no way gave them access to God's kingdom. We have to see that clearly, that even though what they taught originally came from God, they could not enter into the kingdom. They were people without firsthand experience of entering the kingdom, even though they had access to knowledge that could direct them towards the kingdom. They were obsessed with an earthly kingdom, with the systems of men, not the rule and the ways of God. And it's so important that we need to discern what ministers, ministers are building, because many ministers, if you look closely, are boldly building an earthly kingdom. They are, in fact, using the things of God to strengthen and grow an organization, a ministry, a group, a movement, 
while God has meant us to use the resources that he gives us to build the kingdom, where divine processes are served more than the structures of man and human or religious institutions. If we look at these portions of scripture, Jesus shows that when these leaders encountered people who were about to enter the kingdom of God, who were on the brink of becoming part of God's reign and rule, these leaders prevented them from entering. And this is, this is so sad. And I've even experienced this when we were young and, and still involved in a more traditional church ses- setting. I always find it astounding how people that really seek God and zealously desire the things of God often encounter opposition from their leaders and are blocked in seeking God. Their excitement is squashed and they are pressurized to conform to the religious expectation of the institution that they are part of. I'll never forget when we were young, our Dutch Reformed pastor expressed his dismay that all his best church members absconded and went to charismatic churches. And he could not understand it because these good people that he thought was really his best members went to the sectarian churches in his his perspective. And I always wondered, didn't he listen to his own words? He testifies that these are the people that seek God. And then he complains that they go somewhere else. Why? Because There where they were, their excitement was squashed and they were not allowed to seek the Lord. They were not allowed to enter in. Law functioning will cause others to participate in keeping people out and away from the kingdom of heaven. Legalists will insist others become part of an alternative earthly work, a religious endeavor that may look very godly, but is in fact not part of the kingdom of heaven. Making people believe that they are part of the heavenly kingdom and thus deceiving them. These leaders that Jesus spoke to used their influential position in society and religious circles to prohibit and inhibit anyone from pursuing divine intentions. The word prohibit means to forbid by law, rule, or other authority. And the Lord in inhibit means to hinder restrain and prevent and jesus says this is the problem with these leaders that they are prohibiting and inhibiting people from accessing the kingdom if we go to luke eleven fifty two, 52 where he mentions the same conversation that jesus had with the pharisees he says jesus said to them woe you woe to you lawyers for you have taken away the key of knowledge you did not enter in yourselves And those who were entering in, you hindered, you prevented from entering, you withstood them. See in this verse that that he talks to you lawyers. He's talking to legalists. These law experts have taken the key of knowledge away from other people. You see, there's knowledge provided in scripture that must be unlocked in order for people to receive the God intended benefit to enter his kingdom. The key makes the knowledge understandable and transformational. Without the right key, knowledge, instead of granting access to God, becomes a hindrance and a blockage to God. And without the key, knowledge becomes a tool that can be abused by legalists for their own purposes and kingdom. Instead of giving people access to godly knowledge, that will help them to come to God and enter his kingdom, their way of functioning prevents people from gaining such beneficial knowledge. So, so sad. Law typically entails a lot of knowledge. Yet, in spite of obtaining all this knowledge, people never enter into the power of the kingdom. Again, we see when Paul writes in 2 Tim- Timothy 3, He talks about these type of people as ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Isn't that sad? Knowledge is acquired, but the knowledge of truth is never reached. Law does not bring you to truth. And this is so important. Hear what I'm saying. Law does not bring you to truth because law is not truth. 
It is simply the type and shadow of the truth that, ha that would come in Christ. They that learn law are not in the truth, nor do they have knowledge of the truth. At best, they are given a distant preview, a crude contour of aspects of authentic truth that was only inaugurated and constituted in Christ. Legalists will tell other people everything they know to impress them and to be important. They keep the key. They don't release it to other people. Possessing the knowledge ensures their importance. They share much knowledge, but not what would empower others towards kingdom living. And thus they will hinder those that want to enter. They will make it difficult for those that seek Christ and not laws. They will make it difficult for those that seek a powerful spiritual life and not mere symbols and rules. How sad that when some people come close to accessing the kingdom, such distorting perspectives of God thwart them at their final approach into kingdom fullness. In the case of Jewish religious leaders, Christianity was violently rejected. If we read the book of Acts, we see it clearly. And in the context of Christianity, we see that people are pulling back, people are pulling away from the kingdom because they are being pulled into rules, into regulations and Old Testament functioning. And this is devastating and locking up the kingdom so that people cannot access God's life. The next thing that Jesus talks about in Matthew 23, 14, we read, he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. We see that these legalists abuse the weak in society. They stole from and devoured the weakest in their community. They lived on and made a living from those that lacked, those that were not whole or strong or provided for. And these spiritual leaders, instead of providing for and strengthening the life of those that are fragile in society, they weakened and took from those needy people. They abused and used the weak for their own gain and grat grat gratification, their own riches, their own position, their own honor. And they were more than willing to weaken the weak for the pursuit of their own position and advantage. Shocking. They disadvantaged the disadvantaged. And I've seen this in legalistic groups, and I've found and noted, and it's quite interesting for me to see that many times when you have certain groups that are very legalistic, they attract a lot of older people. I'm not sure why, maybe because of their religious upbringing or their discontent with the expression of modern Christianity that they are not comfortable with. I don't know why, but it does seem to be quite often that legalism is effective in exercising an influence over older people. The next thing that we see that Jesus talks about is in verse 14. He shows us that legalists use religion for the show. In Matthew 23, 14, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He, he re repeats this sentence over and over again. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. That word pretense is an outward showing. It means cloak or color. These religious leaders invested much into having an outward appearance looking good. Not just as we mentioned before in previous sessions in the clothes that they wore, but in this instance, they brought this outward appearance, this outward showing by using religious expressions. They would use prayer and worship. This word long prayers also refers to worship. And it's so Shocking to understand that prayer and worship, two things that God has called as our very investments to seek God, to relate with God from a pure heart in their lives become a tool to manipulate people around them. It's an effective mechanism to sway others 
and convince them of your piety and godliness, even if there is none. And Jesus says, this is exactly what they do. And this is exactly the opposite of what Jesus spoke about when he spoke to the Samaritan woman in John 4. We said that the worship that God looks for is worship that is in spirit and truth. And these legalists, these law keepers, their worship was not in spirit nor truth. It was in flesh to promote a lie, to deceive other people in order for them to gain something from them. No wonder that Jesus states in this verse that these leaders will have a much greater judgment and condemnation meted out on them for their deceptive and abusive functioning. In verse 15, we, we read the next sign, next characteristic of, of uh, legalism. Legalism works very hard to gain followers. In Matthew 23, 15, Jesus says to you, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte or one con convert. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Jesus says these men make disciples at great cost. They even went into far-flung places to make converts for Juda Judaism. And even today, we see many ministers working hard at gaining followers. They are chasing after disciples, making people in their image to be like them, not to be like Christ. They are working so hard to get people to follow them, to be their devotees, to be their supporters and admirers instead of Christ's. They convert them and make them adherents to their ministry and theology and brand, but not to the ways of Jesus Christ. He talks about them traveling land and sea. Many counterfeit ministers go to foreign places for recognition because it's much more difficult where you are with people that know you well. They escape situations where long-term investments and authenticity is required. Does Jesus not say people are never uh, recognized in their own communities, but it's so much easier to get recognition if you go somewhere else. And this is a something that these legalists did in order for them to get a following because of their lack of real character in their own hometown situations, it became clear to people that they were not authentic. Jesus says these religious leaders produce children of hell like themselves and even worse. Wow, what a shocking statement. Jesus calls these Pharisees, these religious leaders of his time, children of hell, even though they worshiped the God of heaven and earth and followed the, Lord's, the laws God gave to Moses, even though they adhered to sacred Jewish regulations, the traditions received from those who served God through the history of Israel, they are still children of hell. And they reproduce and develop others to be children of hell themselves. Sure. It is clear Jesus is showing us this is no small deviation from those that belong to the kingdom of God. In fact, it is the total opposite of being a child of God. They are not in the kingdom of heaven. They are not the children of God. They are in the kingdom of Satan to the point of being his children. Does it in any way seem viable that Jesus was trying to recycle and repackage Judaism and law for those that would believe in him? I believe the answer is clear. No. We must see the seriousness of this reality. This is deception unto hell. And what, and what association does hell have with heaven? None. We need to see this deception is from the pit of hell. Legalism, keeping the law, is from the pit of hell. It's not merely Christianity with a small twist or a slight error. We cannot allow this deception to have free reign without giving hell unhindered access in our faith communities. Next, we see in verse 16 that Jesus talks about these legalists as being blind gui guides, fools, 
focused on fabrications. We see in Matthew 23, 16, he says, Woe to you blind guides. The word guide is also leader. Woe to you blind leaders who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Jesus said that they were blind leaders because they cannot see. They could not discern truth, nor could they lead other people in truth. Even if the source material they started working with were divine directives given to Moses, they did not have truth. They promoted a false focus. They did not discern what is really important, but directed people to consider their interpretations, their even inventions and embellishments of Scripture as being important. We must hear, if you do, often we hear people say that are functioning this way, if you do this or that, or if you do this or that this way, then God will answer you and power will be released in your life. Because that's what they say basically here. If you swear not by the temple, but by the gold of the temple, then the thing that you are doing, the obligation that you are bringing will stand. They are giving very specific directions of how to go about in order to be more effective. But what they are bringing are fabrications. It's not scripture. It's not what God said. They bring people to, to, to put their attention to physical things. But they talk about the temple, the gold of the temple, the altar. F physical things are deemed important and given, given precedence as they intimate that the exact observance of specifications at the exact right place in the exact right manner will make you effective. In interpreting the word legalistically, you cannot but add interpretations and stipulations. Why do I say that? Because followers need to be helped to fulfill the demands of the law in unique and different realities that were not relevant in previous generations. It's interesting. David Pawson tells a story of where he had to fly to Israel and he got this, a very special flight that somebody organized for him that was taking a lot of rabbis back to Israel. And as he sat with those rabbis in that airplane, he started asking each one of them questions. And he asked them, do you follow the following law? Do you do the following as a commandment that God has given? And with each one of the religious leaders, the Judaic leaders that was on that flight, he, he asked them a question about things that is supposed to be regulations that they must follow where they said, no, we're not following that regulation because of this unique situation. We got permission from our leader to not do that one. And because there's not a temple, this one is not relevant anymore. And so when you are moving into legalism, you always need somebody that helps to interpret how will you fulfill those requirements in the unique and different realities of life. The expert in law thus must become the interpreter of law because a normal man does not have enough expertise to accurately figure out how to conform to what is commanded. Thus, the minister grows in importance and the follower becomes more dependent on this expert. And this, again, is the opposite of what true Christianity endorses because true Christianity says we no longer need an expert between us and God, but we relate directly with God in relationship and are led and guided by the Spirit firsthand. So, if you look closely, you will realize that certain methods are adopted and perpetuated and that superstitions action, superstitious actions through the use of holy and special objects or substances are required in the pursuit of spiritual results like these leaders leading people to swear by the gold in the temple to have effectively empowered and validated an oath law will result in this type of false reality i mean how common is it among certain christian circles 
to find people that says, no, you must use oil, not just any oil, special oil from Jerusalem. If you use that to anoint somebody, then it has power. Or if you pray under a prayer shawl, then your prayer has much power. Or if you lay the prayer shawl on someone, oh, they will then receive something from God. No, no, you must blow the shofar because then power is released. You must light the menorah lights for the spirit to be present. Oh, the Jewish flag has such special significance. We must have it in our church. And so we see how physical things are the things that are looked to because in legalism, those things start to facilitate and have special power in order to acquire the so-called blessing that we are looking for. This is deception, Jesus said. What does Jesus call these people that promote and perpetuate this type of religion? In this verse, Jesus calls them fools. He says, you fools. The word fool means to be dull, to be stupid, to be absurd. Jesus calls them fools and blind. They're not merely mistaken or some wise, some wise individuals who have some folly sprinkled in. They are fools. What they have become speaks of what is absurd and stupid in Jesus' perspective. It's not my perspective. This is what Jesus says. Yet in Christian circles, often such functioning is held as great wisdom and sophistication. But to function this way, Jesus says, is to, to be blind. You are not able to see the light. No capacity for right perspective will be in an environment where people function this way. There will not be clarity. There will not be progress. I imagine myself, if you think of a blind person, a blind person stays in a small world because they cannot see. And they have to become comfortable with a small environment where they can move in easily because of their lack of sight. They get well acquainted with the environment of legalism. They are not able to evolve or enter new dimensions of God or receive revelation that would unlock the kingdom more, progressive, more progressively in themselves or others. This is so sad, yet it is so common. What you get is regurgitations, not revelation. Delving for more old information from whatever obscure source they can find. You will see no capacity for progressive kingdom vision that can unlock the fullness of the kingdom in our faith communities. The deception devastates the church and keeps people in darkness. They are blind. And if you are blind, no matter how much light is available, you cannot perceive or receive that light. You are doomed to religious repetition that will make you walk in circles and get you entangled in the flesh. Because this is exactly what these scribes and Pharisees displayed. Okay, let's go back to Matthew 23, verse 17 to 18, and we see what Jesus says further here. He says, fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. You see, these men are not able to discern. Their reasoning is foolish and defective. They cannot see what is really important, and they do not recognize the order of things, the priorities that correspond to divine perspective. Their outlook is thoroughly earthly, worldly, and human. And their determination of value is totally upside down to God's. Truth cannot proceed from such fools. This is obvious, and this is why Jesus has a problem with these religious leaders. Next, we see in verse 23 that Jesus shows us that people that are legalistic major in minors, and they neglect what is most important. In Matthew 23, verse 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, 
For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. And we also read the same portion in Luke 11, 42, where he says, For you tithe mint, rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. It is easy to do small things in law. It's easy to do external, superficial, superficial, less important things. And these men majored in the minors as if that would move God and make them acceptable to him. Imagine these spiritual leaders meticulously working out the tithe of their herbs, weighing and paying a few grams of leaves or twigs to take to the temple as an offering of some sort. Was this really what God had in mind when he commanded his people to implement the tithing principle in the functioning of the tabernacle? Should this be the chief part of a religious leader's focus and investment of time and effort? Surely not. The weightier and more important things, Jesus says, the things that are important to God are much more challenging. The su supreme directives of the kingdom of heaven, justice, mercy, love, and faith. This is what's important for God. And not one of these aspects that are central to the kingdom of God can be produced by man. Our sinful nature is contrary to their existence in our person. And only God in us can make adherence to these vital realities possible. You see, in essence, the Pharisees were totally impotent to even start achieving these divine prerogatives because law is powerless and incapable of producing any of these virtues. It can only declare you deficient or a transgressor of these weighty requirements of the kingdom. How many people are motivated by false ministers to invest so much time, so much focus and effort into external and trivial? biblical peculiarities they will show you something in the bible and urge you to apply it in your life yet the very essence and the bulk of the gospel and of the service to christ is wholly unheeded or omitted we have made this mistake even in our prayer ministries and movements we cannot major in the minors we must stand in the supreme directives of the kingdom and then Jesus says to them further in verse 23, these things you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a net and swallow a camel. The word strain here means to filter. And a net could, have, could be a mosquito or a very small insect. And Jesus says that they keep themselves busy with these small things but they swallow the camel. They filter out small un unimportant things, but they gulp down entirely that which is as big as a camel. They focus endlessly on small, unimportant, and inconsequential things, but allow critical major issues to go unchecked. They missed what was important in the name of what was negligible. This causes much turmoil as small things are confronted and made big issues. It's made controversial. While what really should be addressed or deemed important, like the lack of love and faith, is permitted and left unaddressed, causing much greater destruction to those that are involved. You see, legalism will get you stuck in what is minor and cause you to become disobedient to God in the things he actually demands and that actually matters. Jesus shows that the important pursuits of justice, faith, mercy, and love should have been pursued. And only after that has been pursued, once those things have been accomplished, could there be space for doing the smaller things. Then only will the trivial matters take up their rightful place in completing these men's obedience to God. We continue to verse 25, where we see that Jesus complains about token cleansing. 
He says in verse 25 of Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Again, we read also in Luke 11 from verse 39, we, it says, then the Lord said to them, now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? These men focused on externals, what was on the surface, what was visible, what was part of the presentation while they ignored what is inside, the true inner state, the inner reality. Now, when you give great attention to display, cleansing what is visible, and you do, and you do not purify and sanctify the soul, the mind, the core of an individual. And this is hypocrisy. This is playing and pretending. They are playing church. They are doing religious make-believe. There is no real desire for holiness and purity here. It's all an act, a show, a perception that is created. The substance is not pursued or desired. Again, it is a form of godliness without the power. So cleansing is but an impression. It's not actually as something substantial. And Jesus shows the absolute need for cleansing and the act that the actual defilement that man has must be addressed. It is an inner defilement. Jesus says to them, this must be done first. That word first means first in time, first in place, first in order of importance. We must first clean the inside. Then the outside will automatically be brought to cleansing. If inward cleansing is prioritized and addressed, the outer purity will follow as a natural outflow. It will be the fruit, the product of the inner process. Then it's not a show. Then it is the evidence of the substance that is already there. The inner focus is the first and the chief work. And once this is in place, then outer details are warranted. But legalists make the outer trivialities their chief endeavor. And this brings us to the supreme truth in Christianity that only Christ and not man can bring the cleansing inside of man. You see, in essence, when we pursue law, we will be utterly incapable of bringing change inside of us. As we will see further in the series, this is, very, this is the very reason why law is never the remedy for our justification and sanctification. Many false ministers promote cleansing that is dependent on own effort, adhering to rules and specifications, often of their own making or even from scripture. And Jesus never validated this way of living. Jesus confronted the Pharisees in these passages because despite the fanfare with which they advocated for cleansing, remember when his disciples didn't wash their hands when they ate the wheat from the fields. They were so advocating for the fact that they needed to wash their hands. In spite of that fanfare, inwardly they were full of extortion, self-indulgence, greed, and wickedness. And this is what Jesus focuses on. The word extortion here means to pillage, to spoil. Self-indulgence refers to the lack of self-restraint. There's excesses. And wickedness talks about depravity, malice, plots, sins, and iniquity. This is what the true condition of these legalists were inside of themselves. But they were making a big case about washing hands. Jesus, is question, Jesus questions a life that is all show, that makes trivial externals important while allowing for inward conditions that are completely depraved and sinful. On the other side, these leaders excused grave sin in the name of small external distractions. Legalism will always do that. Think about court cases in the natural world. 
Think of how many times we see court cases upended due to te technicalities, small details, while the grave wickedness of the accused is evident for all. That aspect goes unanswered because of trivialities and procedures. And this is exactly what legalism does. In the name of small things, technicalities, we simply do not address the core issues. Jesus said to these religious leaders that this way of functioning is how fools live. It is unwise, mindless, stupid, ignorant, and unbelieving. God made the internal and the external. Both must honor him and both must represent him, the holy God. If we go to Luke 11, 41, it says, but rather give alms of such things as you have. Then indeed, all these things are clean to you. So in the same conversation where Jesus talks about this token cleansing, in Luke, it is recorded that he followed up that those words with the fact that they should rather give alms and that they should, uh, in doing this, that they will clean themselves. Jesus spoke to those who insisted on living religiously and said it would be better for them to give alms and to show compassion to the poor than compulsively fostering small ceremonial acts of purification. Such, such investments will have greater value in the kingdom and even in their own religious lives. Giving what they had to those in need, then all things would become clean to them, Jesus says. If there must be an external focus. This is what Jesus is basically saying. Let it be to help and uplift the needy with what you have. This would at least ensure that you please God. And it would facilitate a, a type of cleansing that heaven endorses. And it's interesting that this is exactly what James says in James 1.27. He says, pure and undefiled religion. The word religion there means ceremonial observance. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. These are the only two areas wherein the gospel allows for any form of legalism. Looking after the poor and weak and keeping oneself from becoming defiled by sin. Jesus clearly represents this paradigm in his interaction with the scribes and Pharisees. And this is the only time where any form of legalism will suffice or be allowed because God has not called us to legalism. Next, we see in verse 27 and 28 that Jesus shows us that these legalists made things to look beautiful that in fact was dead. He says in verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautifully outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Focusing on externals, and unimportant details makes us like whitewashed graves. Looking white, clean, and good on the outside, but it is only a cover. It's a smoke screen to hide the abundance, abundant presence of death and immense impurity and uncleanness beneath. You see, the purpose of a grave is to house death and the dead, or what is left of them. Functioning in this way promotes death and impurity. Legalism produces, maintains, fosters, and conceals death. Law-keeping is utterly unable to overcome death as it actually cultivates death. Law-functioning contributes to sinfulness and the strengthening of the sinful nature. That's why it leads to the consequences of sin, which is uncleanness and death. This is the dead bone reference. You see, no level of beautification can make death look good, or make death smell good, or make death attractive or pleasing to man. I'll never forget many times that we have visited Europe, and we've been in a lot of those big cathedrals where 
They have boxes with bones and teeth and skulls and skeletons, golden boxes and marble art pieces to try and beautify that which is dead. Nothing can beautify death. Death is a terrible reality. And yet when you are functioning in law and legalism, you have to work very hard to try and make it look beautiful. We go to verse 28. It continues and says, even so you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. The religious folk, the law-keeping folk appeared righteous. That word righteous can also be translated as innocent or holy. They appeared righteous outwardly. They majored in how to present themselves to others. And Jesus shows this is nothing else than whitewash, a thin layer of paint applied to the outer layer of a tomb. This make-believe righteousness hides an inward reality of deception. The deception is you are really full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That word lawlessness is iniquity, violation of law and wickedness. Isn't this ironic? That those that insist that people keep the law those that promote law and regulations as a way of life, in fact, in Christ's own assessment, they are lawless. They are transgressors and violators of God's law. Luke says, says it this way in Luke 11.44 when he references the same situation. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen. And the men who walk over them are not aware of them. You see, these leaders did not have life, nor were they able to give life. They were but those that contained the remnants of what once lived. People walked over these unseen graves. They interacted with these religious leaders without even being aware that they were defiling themselves and interacting with death and with what is dead. And this reference, I believe these Pharisees understood very well because Numbers 19 and 16 declared that whoever touched a grave would be unclean for seven days. And this is what Jesus intimates, is that the fact that people have interaction with these legalists make them unclean as a grave would make you unclean. This image shows that interacting with these religious men was actually defiling the lives of the ones who sought their guidance. Followers were not aware of this reality, reality because of the perception that was created, because of the deception that was upheld by these leaders. We have to state emphatically that it is no different for New Testament believers who are led astray by modern promoters of Jewish law and Old Testament regulations. They are defiled and brought into contact with death due to their interaction with such ministries. Then Jesus shows us in Matthew 23, verse 33, what these legalists really were. He says to them, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Sure. Jesus calls the law-promoting religious cabal serpents. That word serpent is the word artful, malicious persons he calls him a brood of vipers the word brood is the offspring the fruit of vipers poisonous snakes and jesus says they will not escape the damnation of hell i am convinced that this fiery and even insulting discourse of jesus is not merely symbolic language or him referencing specific personalities that stood before him. Jesus revealed the very source of this type of religion. No wonder their fate will be such utter judgment and damnation, because this is deception from hell and will ultimately take people to hell if they persist in these ways. This must be a grave warning to us as believers. Venturing, in, venturing into legalism, is not simply adopting a colorful, embellished version of the gospel. It is hellish and will condemn to hell. No, Jesus absolutely nowhere in these passages validated those who promoted law. 
Then we continue to verse 34, where Jesus shows us how legalists handle true believers. He says in verse 34, Therefore, indeed, I sent you prophets, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute, persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechia, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jesus revealed in this passage that righteous men, true believers, servants of God, will be sent to these religious and legalistic Jews. And he assures us, he assures his audience that when that happens, these very law promoters will persecute God's people and kill them. The spirit under which legalists functions are vehement in opposition and oppression of that which is from God. Abusing true followers of God by enforcing their religious interpretation of what is right and wrong, as well as using their position of power in the, a religious system. It is no surprise then that this system would, would later have become the very enemy of Christianity and they, it sought the eradication of the new way that was inaugurated by the sacrifice of Christ. Jesus knew this and he said it would be proven that this, is a, this evil nature of legalism, this form of deception will be proven when he sends these righteous people their way. We read, where Luke says in Luke eleven fifty three, And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say, that they may accuse him. After Jesus confronts the religious law promoters of his time, we see them react to both his message and to him the messenger. They are immediately triggered, not to repent of the wrongdoings Jesus pointed out, but to destroy Jesus with all their might. False ministers, especially in legalism, will always persecute the righteous. In the history of the church, they wrought much greater damage to the kingdom of God than godless, worldly sinners ever could. Their response to Jesus was a sure indication of their desire to continue in their sinful, deceiving ways. They vehemently assailed him. That word vehemently means terribly, excessively, grievously. The word assail means to ensnare, to try and entangle, to quarrel. You see, the assault that they brought on Jesus was no small assault. They cross-examined him. They provoked him to speak of many things. They were looking for something. They were looking for anything by which they could entrap Jesus so that they could bring him down. They were lying in wait. That word means to lurk, to plot. It also means assassination. Wow. They were seeking to assassinate Jesus. They tried to provoke Jesus. If they could make him do or say something wrong, they could bring disrepute on him to justify themselves. Then they could put the focus on his defects so that they could hide their own. And this is the problem with the spirit of legalism. It will always work to entrap and accuse the other party, especially those that really seek God, in order to justify their own conduct and hide their own evil ways. Law keeping bolsters the brutal judging of others. If anyone dares oppose them with truth, that person gets assassinated with accusations about things that they did and said. And sometimes they will even use deeds and words that were done long time ago to disqualify somebody in other people's eyes and to validate their own ministry of law. As we have seen during the trial of Jesus himself, we saw how they were even willing to pay false witnesses to collaborate their narratives of what they said Jesus said in order for them to be able to destroy them, to destroy him. How terrible, how ungodly. And yet this is the reality 
of those that persist in pursuing legalism and law living. And we see that in our day, where this deception is bringing this destruction. You see, if we look closely, you will see that no one preaches as much against other churches and ministries than those that are themselves deceived and consequently deem their doctrine exclusive in exactness, replete with special revelation, affording them only divine redemption and the approval of heaven. Their message tends to be that the only way that anyone can obtain the endorsement of heaven is by adopting their brand of truth and submitting to their authority and law keeping. My friends, this is the sure proof of evil deception at work in communities. And we cannot allow the enemy to hoodwink us. Jesus was clear about his condemnation of the very religious leaders of his time, with no exception. When he spoke about them, it was negative because he is clear that what they brought forth was in opposition to God and his kingdom, not contributing to it. Next time, we will start looking at other facets, especially of Judaic type of Christianity that is so promoted in our modern time. I just want to look at, just summarize what we looked at today. In our previous session, we looked at the signs of legalism. We looked at the fact that they taught truth but did not live it, the fact that they burdened followers but didn't help followers in carrying those burdens, the fact that legalists do things to be seen by men and that they do things to be important. Today, we looked at the fact that legalism breeds hypocrisy, legalism blocks the kingdom, legalism abuses the weak, it uses religion for show. It works hard to gain adherence. It, blind, it, it is blind. It, it is foolish and focuses on fabrications. It majors in minors while neglecting what is important. You see token cleansing. You see people looking good but filled with death. And we see the true nature, which is that they are like serpents and a brood of vipers. And then we, we finished off with the fact that this type of deception will always persecute true believers and we will see it in the way that they handle people that really seek God.